unless you acknowledge God in your life, and unless you acknowledge Him daily, Amen. I'm just going to tell you, life's not going to work. Amen. At no matter what age you're at, at never at whatever chapter in life you're at, life is not going to work right without acknowledging Him, and and welcome Him into the journey of your life, whatever it is, yeah. and at whatever stage and I. And, and, and I think I could get us all to vouch for this. Yeah. At whatever stage you cease to do that, life stops working. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize it at the moment until you get to the place where this isn't going right. But that leads me to the second thing that I've, I've said both times. And I said it recently at a, at a breakfast that we were invited to. If you ever find, I've said this to all my children. Now listen, I want you to know from the front end, you know, I can only be who I am, and I'm not a deep theological thinker. And I'm not opposed to those thinkers. They're important, but that's just not me. And God has to keep things simple. And I'm going to tell you this. I've said this over and over again, and this is what I've told my own children. If you find yourself in a dark place where it feels as if the waters have gone over your head and there's no sound place to set your foot, if you will call upon the name of the Lord. He is rich in mercy and full of loving kindness. He will hear the cry of the afflicted and those in need. And He will help you. Now that doesn't mean everything might change overnight. But it means He'll meet you in that place and begin to walk you through the midst of it. And that's about, listen, that's not real deep. And it's not real, you know, but if I was speaking into people's life, that's exactly what I'd say. You have to acknowledge Him on a regular basis in order for life to work. And when you detour, as all of us in this room have, if you'll call upon His name, He will meet you in that place and He will help you. And so, um, another testimony before we get into the Word, and it's a a testimony of praise. It's a testimony of learning. It's a testimony of a journey. And I mentioned this a while back, just touched on it. But the more I've thought on this, the more I've seen it in a daily form. We in our life are focused on very much events. We even pray toward events. You know, uh, I've got an event that I'm waiting for in my life. That event is the sale of our house. You know, that event is something that we're wanting to happen. All right? And so our prayers over the last, really, month, but especially three weeks, have been focused in this direction. Lord, we need our house to sell. We believe that you have started us on this journey, that we're going the direction that you would have for us, so we need you to sell our house. Seems like a pretty honest and grace, you know, prayer right there. And so it ought to be one he's able to fulfill, seeing how he's led us in this direction. Well, there's a little problem with this prayer. Looking at our house as an investment, we think we ought to make something way up here for some sucker that comes along. It's willing to pay this right here, even though the house probably is not worth that right here. And so in the process of waiting for this event to happen, God is more interested in the process of getting there. The journey of what happens until that thing is sold. Well, we realize we've had people come through and the house hasn't sold. You know what? Maybe it's a little high. Let's bring it down a little bit. Then we have a little, you know, activity in our house and still nothing. And so as we begin to sit together, a little bit discouraged and talking through it, my wife says the same thing we both know. If we were wanting to buy this house, would we pay this much for this home? Would we see this home worth this much? We both looked at each other and said, no. No. And so in the process of getting to this event, 
what God did was shine a light upon our heart. You know what He showed us? First thing is called greed. Second thing was called selfishness. We're trying to get the most we can out of somebody whether it's worth it or not. When in reality, this does not change even when it comes to money. Treat them as you would want to be treated in return. And yes, a house is an investment. And yes, you should be able to make some on that house. But are you giving a fair and honest price? Are you asking for that in regard to someone else coming in and buying that? And we had to stop in the midst of the process and say, Lord, no. No. We're really not. We're really waiting for somebody who doesn't know what to do with their money and just pours it into our lap and we can walk away from it knowing that we got a good deal and they probably did not. God's focused on the process. We're focused on the event. And God and His patience... His focus is not the event. It's the process of what He's aiming at. He's aiming at the change of our heart through the valley and the trial we're walking through. What you're walking through is necessary. What I'm walking through is necessary. If God had sold my house when I wanted it sold, I wouldn't have had to deal with greed. And I wouldn't have had to look at the reality that I'm treating someone else less than I would want to be treated myself. Now, events and processes, Psalms 103, verse 7, it says this, Moses knew God's ways, but the children of Israel knew his acts. The children of Israel lived from event to event, but they never knew God. Moses knew God. Because he understood the process. You know why I think he understood the process? Because he spent 40 years in the wilderness walking in a place of humility to realize, God, you are in the desert and the valley places of our life. So with that being said, look at me in Psalms 119. I'm going to touch on this passage and then I'm going to finish up with something. You know, of course, you know, I can't share very well anything that I'm not walking through personally. And so guess what the end of this study is about. It's going to be about change. I mean, we're going through change in our lives, so that's where my where my mind has been. But in Saul, I mean, in first, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, first Corinthians chapter nine. Oh, I thought you said I did. I did. First Corinthians chapter nine. In verse 24. Do you not know? Now listen, the implication, the way he says that, he says, listen, you know this, but I'm going to affirm this to you. I'm I'm going to speak something into your life through this thing that you know. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Verse 24. Verse 24. Proverbs 9, verse 24. So... He says only one (coughs) receives the prize. All right? It's obvious. Listen, if you go to a race, not everybody gets a trophy. Not in the real races. You know? You have to finish and you have to cross first. And so people discipline themselves. And they go through training. We just had, uh, like I said, Carla's grandchildren played the piano. And they really were amazingly beautiful at it. I mean, they just, all three of them just did things all over the piano and it was beautiful. It was like almost a washing just to listen to it. But I can just tell you right now, when it comes to practice, they didn't want to practice every day the time it took to get to where they were. It took discipline. (laughs) It took somebody making them in order to get there. And so when you think about this this race and completing it, he said, listen, not just finishing it, run that you might win. Because he says only, um, or he says, um, 
um, run in such a way that you may win, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. And so often in this Christian journey, we have the mindset of, is this not right? You know what? Everybody gets across the line. I mean, the truth is we all win. So it doesn't matter whether you're running or walking. It's kind of like P.E. You know, you got the group that doesn't really want to, want to run, and they don't care about winning, so they're just kind of walking around the track. But Paul speaks to the church. And he says, listen, you know this. In the games, only one receives the prize. You run that you might win. That means with intensity, with passion. Give yourself to this. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we an imperishable. Therefore, because of this that he said, I... And you know what, as I begin to think about that, he says, he's speaking to the church, and he says, listen, run in such a way that you may win. And in all things, discipline yourself to self-control. Therefore, because of this, but if you look at it, he makes the transition from talking about all you. And he says, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Now here's the point. It becomes personal. He can't run this race for you. He can't, make, he can't come alongside you and say, listen, here's what you need to do. You have to decide that. Listen, some people feel very comfortable watching things on television. Listen, I know I, I grew up with the TVs and idol and shouldn't be in the house and stuff like that. But I'll just tell you, I enjoy watching athletic events. And I also watch the news. That's for me personally. <coughs> you have to decide the sacrifice necessary for you to run this race that you might win. Paul takes it personally. He said, listen, I'm telling you, you must run this race. But as for me, I am running with purpose. I am not boxing and hitting the air. There's a purpose. There's value to what I'm doing. If you lose sight of the purpose and the goal, then you're going to get discouraged in the midst of the discipline. Listen, playing football when I was young, because that's what I wanted to be a part of, from the very beginning of two-a-days, you have an aim. You know what that aim is? It's to win the state championship. And so every day you show up at practice and you go through the heat, and you go through the tires, and you go through the sit-ups, and you go through the this and the that. And if you lose sight of that goal, you begin to say, why are we doing this? Why should I even do... You've lost sight of something. You've taken your eyes off the prize. What you're going through is necessary. Because God is disciplining you. Those little girls, because she, they don't know any better, I can just tell you, looking at their mama, she's had to be the bad guy. And she's had to say, you are going to practice. Because in their youth, left to themselves, they don't see the value in practicing. But now, as they're sitting in front of people, they're beginning to practice their trade that they've been disciplined for and what they're doing is washing over everybody else and they're getting to be a part of it and they feel the acceptance in being a part of it. In the same way God looks at us and says, listen, you don't realize where you're headed and what you're walking through is necessary. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. So Paul stops for a moment and says, Listen, I want you to know, I bring discipline into my own life. And I bring this flesh under, under, under submission. Lest I be disqualified from this race. I was talking to somebody recently and they said, Why are the gifts of the Spirit, why would it say, 
Self-control is one of them. And right here, you would think it would say, God control. Isn't that right? But listen, there are certain things in your life that there are liberties in Scripture to do. But I'm going to tell you this, if you don't practice self-control, they will destroy you. Now look with me in Joshua chapter 3. And verse 1. Now this is, of course, the children of Israel. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. They've already they've come through the Red Sea and out of Egypt. And if you remember, as they passed through that Red Sea event, here were a people in bondage that from the very beginning, what did God say before He ever brought them out? I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. That was not something he figured out once they got in the wilderness. You know what? Let's walk around here and I'll figure it out as we go. Before he ever brought them out of Egypt, he said, I'm going to take you to a land that will become your own. And it is a land flowing with milk and honey. As they come through the Red Sea and they begin their, their journey through the wilderness, they spend 40 years in the wilderness being disciplined, being tested, and being tried. And that's where we come in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the, of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. Now think about this. He said there needs to be a distance. You ever gone someplace and you're right up on somebody and you really can't tell exactly where... He says, listen, you need to pull back. And you need to be able to see where it's going. Because you need to follow. And he says, listen, I'm taking you a way that you've never been before. You do not know the way. And I'm telling you, as we sit in this place, no matter how many theology degrees you may have and Bible Certificates you may, I'm talking like guys in, like, that are in the prison because they've got a million Bible certificates and all the male Bible things they've been through. But you still don't know the way. The purpose of all of this stuff is to bring you into relationship with Him. He is going to lead and guide you. Isaiah 51, verse 1 says this You who pursue righteousness. Who seek the Lord. Is there anybody like that in here? He tells you. He's talking to the children. He says, look to the rock from which you've been hewn and to the quarry from which you've been dug. Look to Abraham your father and Sarah who gave you birth. So what he's saying is, in your journey, in your pursuing righteousness, and you're seeking after Him, if you want to be encouraged in this journey, look back at the life of Abraham. What does it say in Romans? Abraham is the father of the... Faith, right? The father of the faith. All right, so he's telling you this. Look at, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> he's telling you to look back and see how that faith is walked out. All right? Here, in Hebrews 11, 8, it says this. It says, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. Has God called you? Have you sensed the call? Listen, I'm talking about, listen, it can be called a ministry or called to this, but called to relationship with Him, called to pursue Him, called to know Him. Abraham began his journey by simply stepping forward and obeying that which God put on his heart. And then he began this journey of one step in front of the other, but it says this, he went out to receive an inheritance and he went out 
not knowing where he was going. Now think about that for a moment. Listen, think about the conversations he and Sarah had. All right, honey, let's get everybody together. Let's pack all this stuff up. Where are we going? You know what? We're heading toward an inheritance. All right, you know where it is? Not exactly. Do you know where we're going? No. Now listen, we read these things, but we look at them and we totally overlook the conversations that must have been had, the struggle that must have been faced there. I don't know where I'm going. All I know is that God has called us. All I know is that He's taking us somewhere. And all I can do is put one foot of obedience in front of the other. And then I have to trust Him. And it says, as they began this journey, they walked forward as aliens. Strangers. And it says this, it says, they lived in tents in the land of promise. So once they got to the physical land that God has promised, there was still something different in their heart. It said they were looking for a kingdom not made with hands eternal in the heavens whose, builder and architect, or whose architect and builder is God. So even when they got to the physical land of promise, they knew there was something more. Now as I begin to consider this in my own life, all through my journey, people have told me, Andy, at some time you're going to settle down. Once you get married, you're going to settle down. Well, listen, when I got married, that's when I started traveling all through the southeast. You know, I was, you know, just going all north, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, just going every month on this circuit. Andy, once you start having children, there was a little bit more truth to that. You know, but I still traveled all over the place. But you know what? God gave me a nice spot recently. And I've been there 10 years. And I've become very comfortable. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I've gotten to know people. It, it, you know, and people become a part of our lives. We've done Bible studies out of our home. Um, I have breakfast and coffee with different people there on a regular basis. Just building relationships. All the things that I do everywhere else. And then comes this journey to come here. And it's completely unknown to me. And it's completely unknown to the family. And we're going through right now, if you can pray for us, we're going through the process of letting go and moving on to something unfamiliar. And my children, especially the daughters, you know, it's just an emotional roller coaster, especially this last week, because it's, you know, with this friend, and then it's tears, and it's tears, and it's tears, and it's this, and it's tears, and, it's t- and you know, and it's normal, and it's, it's a part of the process, but it also shows me how rooted we've become, and why should I fight against it if I'm an alien and stranger seeking to follow him? And so then in this process, I want to read to you. Mm, Numbers 32. And here's the warning. Now, in this part, here's what's happened, and then we'll read the verse. The children of Israel had come to the Jordan River, and there were two and a half tribes. Um... Reuben, and I think Gad or something. I can't remember the names of each one. We'll see it in just a minute. Uh, Reuben yeah. and uh, Gad. Um, I think there was another half-tribe. But, but they had come up to Moses and to Joshua, and they said, Listen, on this side of the Jordan is a wonderful place to raise cattle. And guess what we have? <coughs> we have cattle. This is perfect for us. And they had come to a place where they got settled on this side of the Jordan River. Now let me ask you a question before we move on, because I know we've got some Bible scholars here. When God spoke to them in Egypt, and He said, I'm taking you out to a land flowing with milk and honey. 
Does anybody remember the passage that says, I'm taking all of you except the two and a half tribes? And two and a half tribes I'm going to put on this side of the Jordan, but the rest of you I'm going to get on that side. Because really I know that you guys are going to love cattle, and there's a great spot for cattle on this side of the Jordan. Did you know? Okay, I thought... (laughs) It doesn't say that. Therefore, God's intention was to bring all of the children of Israel into this promised land. But once they got there, and there was a season of being settled. It wasn't like they got there and then they moved over. There was a season of being settled there. And in being settled there, they thought, this is a great place for us. And here's the thing. Why would I let go of what I have? when I don't know what lies ahead. Why would I let go of what I have when I don't know what lies ahead? Now listen, how many times have we settled for something that isn't God's best? Now let me tell you something, just like just like the, the GPS that I use all the time. That GPS tells me how to get to where I'm going. Now here's something in my mind. I just like to see it, but I already know where I'm going. I've already got a pretty good idea how to get from here to Tyler. But that GPS has something up in the heavens called a satellite system. I don't know how it works. I might even be wrong about that. Somehow, (laughs) somehow something tells that GPS there's an accident or there's construction in front of me. So really what you need to do is take a right over here. That doesn't make any sense to me. And the closer I get to this alternative route, that lady just keeps talking to me. You got one more mile. You got about a thousand feet. And so I just turn her voice off. (laughs) I just hit mute. I don't have to listen to it. And then guess what happens? She was right and I get stuck. But here's something else. If I will just stop at that point and listen, she'll start saying redirecting. Redirecting. And even in the midst of our choices where we have missed it, God will meet us in that place and get us where we need to be. He will redirect. And as I look at these children of Israel, God allowed them to have that piece of land, even though I truly believe it was not God's intention to give that to them. And you know what they constantly had to deal with from that point on? The insecurity of their own heart. And they had to establish a memorial that says, you guys don't forget about us because we're still a part of you. They had to deal with the insecurity of always knowing they were not where God intended them to be. God gave them what they wanted and He gave them what they asked for. But He said, I always intended for you to be over here. And then He says in verse 23, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. He says, listen, all right, I will give you this land, but you at least have to go over there and help them. And if you don't know this... That in the end, it's going to find you out. You're going to realize that you're not doing what you should be doing. And there's a lot of things that their families never got to experience because they were too afraid to trust in going away they never went before. Do you realize that their children never got to see the fall of Jericho? They only got to hear about it. Do you realize that their children never got to see the giants falling? in the promised land and the victories that were gained. You know why? Because they were on the other side of the Jordan, living in the walled cities, watching cattle graze upon the land. Because they were unwilling to let go of what they had for fear that there might not be anything else ahead of you. This journey is a walk of faith. It says we walk not by sight, but by faith. Faith requires you To have confidence in that which you cannot see.
I want to ask you, are there some things that God's requiring of you? But in that requirement, He's saying you're going to have to follow. Let's finish in Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Look with me in verse 13. And as I was studying this and just looking over the the psalm itself, I don't know why I feel like i got to show you my Bible. I guess because I don't write on a big board or something. Your way, O God, is holy. Alright? To me, what stands out, your way, your direction, your path, right? Your way is holy. We're going to look at that way in Psalm 77. And it says, What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have, you have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. Look at verse 19. Your way was in the sea, and your paths in the mighty waters, and your footprints may not be known. You led your people like a flock by the land by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now think about this. He said, Your way was in the sea. And it says your footprints were not known. Now think about this. If you're walking a way you've never been before, and if you're following somebody, how many times have we kind of put our step in their step? We just want to get it right and get where they're going. But he said his way was in the sea. His footprints were not known. Because he's saying, I want you to look at me. I want you to look at me. My heart, who I am. I will guide you with my eye upon you. I want you to trust me daily for your daily breath. I'm going to get you... Listen, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you'll acknowledge me moment by moment, I'll make your path straight. I'll get you where you need to be. Now, sometimes in that acknowledgement, he's going to say, I know this is a shocker, but you've got rebellion in your heart. And a part of the process of getting where I want you to be is me shining light upon that. A part of the process of Him getting us where we need to be as we're looking at Him, He shines a light and He says, you got greed in your heart. It's there. And you stop and say, Lord, I see it. Make my path straight. I see it. Make my path straight. So as we finish up, He's taking you away you've never been before. You're going to have to sometimes let go of the known in order to get to where He wants you to be. And so often the fear is, if I let go of what I have, what if there's nothing else in front of me? And you're going to have to trust Him. I remember being in that place. Listen, it doesn't, even with me, it doesn't mean as much now to me, but I remember in that place, that crossroads at the end of that driveway. I can't tell you, that was a painful process. Because if I let go of this, I might spend the rest of my life being single. And I had to come to a place of being okay with that. I had no idea what God had ahead of me. What are the things in our life? Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. If I had a million dollars sitting in my lap, I'd be very tempted to say, you know what? Let's just close up shop here in Katy. Let's go back to what we know. Let's go back to what we know. We can afford it. We can do this and do this. I'd rather just stay right there. Because I and why? Because I really don't know what's here. I don't know where this part of the journey's headed. 
I'm telling you this, if I was to stay there when God's leading me here, I can promise you this, my sin would find me out. Because the insecurity and the dryness and the staleness would begin to settle in. This journey is a continuation. It's a moving forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be something physical. One of the things that we didn't get to, it says in Corinthians, listen, guys, you ought to be teachers and not babies. You haven't moved on. You haven't moved on. You've become comfortable where you're at. And he said, I want you to become mature. I want you to grow. Where are the places? Listen, there was a place in my life of praise and worship. Where I used to be in a place where you kind of had three songs. And then you sat down. And then at the end you had a song. And I look back at how funny it was. But the struggle of going to other places... And I remember the first time I saw people do this. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what? That actually looks like something I would like to do. But there's no way I'm going to do that. And the next thing you know, I'm doing this. One time I was reading in the Psalms where it says, Let all the people, as in a congregation, shout to the Lord. <laughs> How many of y'all have ever been in a congregation where y'all shout together to the Lord? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would really be cool. That day, that Sunday, I just moved to Houston. I went to some church somebody told me about called Maranatha. And I show up, it's in a schoolroom. There's about 80 people and I'm sitting in a chair. And the pastor gets up and he says, we're going to do something we've never done before. This is the literal truth. And he reads some other portion of Scripture where it said the same thing. And he says... We as a congregation are going to shout to the Lord. <laughs> and he says, here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, we're going to holler out, praise the Lord. And so he says, one, two, three. And he was the only one who shouted. The rest of us just... He said, we are going to do this until we all do it together. Then you do praise the Lord. You know, we're all... He said, listen, we're going to keep doing it. Finally, we all got to the place. Praise the Lord. And wow, it was like... I can't believe that just happened. Listen, it's an adventure. It's a journey where God's trying to take us farther than where we're at. And there's moments of being settled in a place and then the cloud begins to move again. And if you stay where you're at, it all becomes stale. You have to keep moving forward. Do you know I've never... I, that I can remember being in a place. Now I've been in a place where people said, praise the Lord. And especially in the prisons, you hear guys shout out of excitement. Mm-hmm. I've never really done it corporately again since that moment. But I look back at how God was trying to teach me and take me further and into places that I wasn't comfortable in going. So it's not necessarily moving from a house to another place. or move, But it's in your spiritual journey. It's in your relationships with people. There's many different plays and ways where God's saying, You're going to have to trust me. Take this step. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, I I know in me there's just a lot of thoughts that are running through. and, And it's a busy time. But I'm grateful that you just keep giving me little nuggets that I need to keep moving forward. And, uh, And I pray for each of us as we walk away from here that we'll have something to consider, something to give thought to. And I pray that you would take things and examine our heart by it. And Lord, um, I pray that you would nourish us on the words of truth. Lord, teach us your ways. And Lord, give us a heart, and this is my constant prayer for all of us, but I know for me, that my heart would be sensitive to the direction of your Holy Spirit. As Bob McLeod has said, I just know that the fear of God is the fear of missing you. And I don't want to miss you. I want to be right where you want me to be, no matter where that is or what it means. And I know that that's where your favor will be. So Lord, we thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.